Hey, Safer here, and on today's podcast, by popular request, I'm going to talk about the Slavery Myths video. Now, for those of you who haven't seen what happened there, I made an episode a while back that was called 10 Common Slavery Myths. I meant it to be a pretty simple little video, because at the time, I only had 8,000 subscribers, and I never expected the video to blow up like it did. Most of my videos were getting somewhere around 1,500 views to as many as 5,000, but instead, within the first week, it had gone up above 300,000 views. And man, that was a roller coaster. Because as I found out with this whole YouTube thing, the more popular a video is, the more hate it gets in the comments section. And since I deal with fairly political subjects, but in an explicitly historical context, the hate mongers are quite prevalent. I had been called an SJW and a cuck before, and I had learned not to pay any heed to those miscreants, but when you have thousands of people commenting, the whole thing gets crazy. One guy asked, do I dare scroll down to the comments? And I replied, there be dragons. But I have noticed that there are a bunch of you guys who have gone down into that comment section and actually tried to slay some dragons. Unfortunately, as is the case with, they're pretty wedded to their ideology. But I figured I would respond to some of these. Almost none of them deserves a direct response. They're pretty much all idiotic. But it speaks to a larger issue at hand in the United States at the current moment. And it is how history is being used as a bludgeon by guys who try to proclaim themselves as holding history as an ideal while not actually offering particularly good analysis in the process. So this episode was meant to be an intellectual response to that kind of myth-making. So at the beginning of the episode, I said, if you take offense to these facts, go and check my sources. And so, of course, a bunch of these people tried to go down and say, your sources are biased and wrong and blah, blah, blah. I even had one guy compare Snopes and Slate, which I used, to Stormfront, an explicitly white supremacist publication. Now, both Snopes and Slate are well known to lean a little towards the left. Especially Slade, it tends to be explicitly left-leaning, but that doesn't make them wrong in any regard. If you think that bias means incorrect, then you need to figure out a better definition of truth. Truth doesn't care about your bias. As one commenter pointed it out in another video, reality has a well-known liberal bias. But in both of those cases, I was actually using them more as sources for where I got these myths, where I saw that people were saying that these were myths. As in, basically none of what I said in that episode is controversial in the scholastic world. It might be in the political world, but I don't give a damn about the political world. It's the scholarship that matters. And especially in terms of Slate, the author of that article, Rebecca Onion, I've met, attended lectures from Rebecca Onion is well respected in the historical world. So the idea that somehow she's too biased to be relied upon shows that they haven't even looked at what the sources were, but that would require actually checking the sources. Instead, what they're doing is just looking at the publication and saying, oh, it's Slate. I don't like Slate and therefore it's wrong. Well, too bad. I'm a historian, I don't deal with that kind of stupidity. And that's what it is, it's stupidity. The idea that an entire publication is so biased that it can't be taken seriously when it is well reviewed in the scholastic world is patently absurd. And that's what you'll see with a lot of these commenters. They're all patently absurd, and the whole idea is that they're trying to not be challenged. They don't want to engage in historical discourse. Which, if they don't, get off the channel. I don't want you here. Nobody wants you here if you're not willing to engage with the material being presented. That's called scholarship. But these people don't want to live in reality. They want to construct their own. But that's not how reality works. Oh, and another one of these little initial problems that people keep on trying to point out that is kind of silly, but from a different perspective, is that because I have white skin, somehow I'm not allowed to talk about this subject. Well, that's pretty damn racist to begin with. 
But also, the idea that somehow one's ability to research is dependent on your skin color is so dumb, I really don't need to speak about it any further. So let's move on to the first myth, the one that actually seems to be the most controversial, at least among white supremacists, which I don't have any problem being controversial to white supremacists. So the first myth was white slavery in America. Now, I could have mentioned the fact that there were captive economies among American Indians, which included white people, but that's not the same kind of slavery and not really worth putting in a video that is talking about a very specific myth. I did mention other forms of white slavery in the video, and some people seem to have missed that. But I'm not here to talk to people who are ignorant. I'm here to point out that ignorance. Now, a lot of people have been trying to use sources that have been thoroughly debunked. This myth is a fairly new one. It started in about 2001 with a book, which I'm forgetting the name of, something like The Hell of Barbados. And then it spread to white supremacists with books like The Redneck Manifesto and They Were White and They Were Slaves. You can even find some stuff on this website called Global Research, which regularly publishes 9-11 truthers, as though they were peer-reviewed articles. It's not a peer-reviewed publication, yet people will quote it as such. And it basically accepts anything. All of these try to conflate indentured servitude with actual slavery. Now, some people have been trying to say that, like, the modern definition of slavery would apply to indentured servitude, well, that misses the point of the entire video, which clearly states that slavery and indentured servitude were differentiated not only by treatment, but by law. Now, a number of historians have been trying to fight back against this myth, but it just keeps on spreading. There's even an open letter from a whole bunch of Irish historians who are trying to say, just stop, please stop. But it keeps going. So another justification for this myth that I've seen is the analogy that I gave in there, which was that the people who were forced to indenture themselves were kind of like modern prisoners. And a bunch of people are trying to say that, yeah, modern prisoners are slaves. Uh, no, not by any stretch of the definition. That is spurious to say the least. And it is surprising the lengths that these people will go to to try to justify their belief in this. I've had a bunch of people claim that they have ancestors that they know about. Well, let's do the math on that. So this myth centers around people who were indentured during the English Civil War period, the War of the Three Kingdoms, or whatever you want to call it. And they're trying to say that, like, 12-year-olds were being enslaved. <laughs> That's just dumb. There's absolutely no proof to that. But let's try to take them literally. If you have family knowledge from 1645, how many people does that entail? How many people would your family consist of? So if we put generations at about 25 years and go with 1645 as the year that we're going back to, you get 372 years. Divide that by 25, you get 14.88, which we can round up to 15. So 2 to the power of 15 is 32,768 people. That means somehow these people have family knowledge of a little less than 33,000 people. That's fucking ridiculous. You can't have direct family knowledge that somehow is against all historical sources on the subject that goes back 15 generations and somehow has been kept secret from the masses. Essentially, every time that somebody claims that they are a descendant of an Irish slave, they're submitting a conspiracy theory. And conspiracy theories are the bane of every historian's existence. Because essentially, you can't disprove them because every point that you have against them, they just claim secret knowledge. And that's essentially what this is. So you can't conflate indentured servitude with slavery, and you can't claim to have special knowledge outside the realm of verifiability. So I want to get off of number one because basically everyone who is offended by it is a complete and utter idiot who relies on false equivalents and secret knowledge to try to claim their point. 
So number two, which was America invented slavery, a lot of people are like, how can anybody believe that? Interestingly enough, I've actually heard this from students. Plus it was listed as a common myth in a couple of the articles that I have listed in the description. So yeah, it's a pretty easy thing to bust, but one worth busting because I get to talk about the entirety of slavery instead of just American slavery, which was kind of just an excuse, of course. So let's move on to number three. The first slave owner in America was black. I haven't actually seen anyone complaining too much about this besides some idiots who use some choice words that we will not repeat here. And most of them just use what's called blanket refutation, which is just to say, Nuh-uh. Okay, cool, man. Like, you do you. Go off and live in your own little world. We'll live in the real one. So number four and number five are kind of intertwined. A lot of people have put it out like, you say that the Union didn't fight to end slavery, and then you say that it did in number five. No, these are not contradictory in any way. The Union initially fought to bring back the secessionists. The South seceded to maintain slavery. When people say it's seceding over states' rights, that's just code for I don't want to deal with reality. Good old President Wilson wrote an entire chapter called States' Rights that he tried to argue that very point and couldn't help but talk about slavery over and over and over and over and over and over and over again because, well, that's the issue at hand, obviously. The Union was trying to keep the Union together, the South was trying to keep its slaves. Duh. If the Union was purely trying to end slavery in the beginning, then why would there be border states? Duh. Now this is another attempt by the idiots to try to poke a hole where they hope to not be challenged. That there's something deep within them that if it is challenged, then somehow their entire ideology is at stake. And well, if it is, you might want to reconsider your ideology because it's based on a lie. And yes, I did intentionally throw some shade at Woodrow Wilson because, well, he deserves it. So number six, a lot of people have pointed out that I make the distinction of saying Southern freemen. You know, and then they are like, well, in reality, it was only 6% of the South that owned slaves. Well, yeah, that's true. But a good percentage of that South were slaves. And another good chunk of that were people who couldn't own slaves. Also, I don't think that percentage is correct. I don't know it off the top of my head. And I don't care to look it up because, well, it's in the video. You can go watch the video if you want to see. I was purely talking about, as I said in the video, white Southern freemen. So their wives don't count, their children don't count. It's basically only heads of household because, well, those are the people who would own slaves, right? Duh. And that brings the percentage way the heck up. Suddenly you're talking in the 30s rather than below 10. So it's not a small number in any regard. So number seven was factory workers were like slaves. And I bring up Marx's whole wage slavery thing and, you know, I'd call it that tired old Marxist whatever. Now, a lot of people who are actual Marxists, not, you know, the bad word, oh, they're a Marxist, but, you know, like legitimate Marxists, have been saying, like, look, dude, that's not what the whole idea of wage slavery is about. That's a misconstruing of the concept. And that's kind of the point. The concept lends itself to that misconstruing. Marx is famous for having any number of interpretations. And funny enough, basically every Marxist historian starts off by denouncing all other Marxist historians. It's kind of hilarious. But in trying to say that wage slavery is slavery, it is construing it with actual slavery. Yet a factory owner doesn't own you. They don't own their workers. There's some decidedly despicable parts to that history as well, but we're here to discuss it being construed as slavery, which is false. Now in the middle of that, I mentioned the fact that a lot of movies make slavery out to be a lot worse than it actually was. And people are like, you can't be a benevolent slave master, show me some proof. I actually 
showed it in the video. I linked to a previous video in which I specifically talk about how 12 Years a Slave misconstrues the original narrative in which it explicitly talks about one of the slave owners who owned Solomon Northrup in nothing but a good light, and then the movie turns him into some evil hypocrite. But this is actually a place where I see a lot of the rhetoric coming from more left-leaning folks. They're not really trying to engage with the material here. What they are trying to do is expound some rhetoric. Which, fine, you can do that all you want, but it doesn't further anything. So I think we can move on to point number eight, which you know I haven't actually seen any commenters complaining about in all seriousness. So we can just skip right on over to number nine. There are some people who are saying that my use of the movie Roots as an example of people expounding that myth, as in Africans were captured by Europeans, which, no, it was an entire economy they were sold. That's the whole thing about slavery. You're sold into it. Duh. Well, Roots does show people raiding inland to do that. Now, there were some cases in the early years of the West African slave trade of Portuguese raiding inland to get slaves, but that was supposedly under the direct commission of local tribes, and there's only a few specific instances of that happening. But what the movie is depicting is something in the late 18th or early 19th century. And it shows people going inland to get slaves, and the whole slave trade system was based on outposts which were typically right on the beach. And that's why I showed Amistad, because Amistad actually shows it correctly, as I say in the video. And then number 10, the other one that is the second most unpopular, I guess. The whole idea that white people ended slavery. Now, at the end, I kind of go like, this is a particularly disgusting one because it makes it seem like the captors are freeing the captives. And then people are like, well, you're talking about American slavery and 600,000 people died to end slavery. Well, for those comments, I will refer you to number four, the Union fought the Civil War to end slavery. That myth contradicts what you are saying. <laughs> but, but I get what people are trying to say. That we should honor the North for ending slavery. And we should. But that doesn't mean white people. The North had a number of other races among it. Abolitionists were not uniformly white. In fact, the most prominent one of them, Frederick Douglass, was most certainly not white. And to equate that to an entire race is still quite disgusting. People also complain that I bring up the Qin Dynasty, you know, and how does that have anything to do with American slavery? It's about the creation of the idea of abolition, that people want to say that abolitionism started as a white idea, and no, no it didn't. In the Chinese legalist tradition, slavery is seen as something of a feudal power, and so by abolishing it, you can get rid of power centered on feudal lords. Now, the Qin actually didn't abolish slavery. I never said that they did. Qin Huangdi is kind of a weird figure, though, because we only have one historian for a source, and that's Sima Qian. And he was writing for the sake of the Han Dynasty, which followed, and he is not exactly happy with the Qin Dynasty. The Grand Historian barely even mentions slavery, and what he does talk about, for the most part, is not what is called slavery, but a corvée. Now, the Chinese corvée system was essentially a way of recruiting locals and forcing them to labor on public works. It is, of course, a type of bondage or unfree labor, but it is not slavery, just as indentured servitude isn't or serfdom isn't. You have to be able to differentiate these things if you want to deal with the reality we live in. They are very different things. Somebody who is a corvée isn't owned. A slave is owned, is property. So if you can't differentiate between the two, I don't know how I can talk to you. And then there's the other part of it where people want to bring up the British. Well, a lot of them want to say like, well, we should acknowledge that the British were the first to end slavery. No, they weren't. And that they fought really hard to end the transatlantic slave trade. Really hard is a bit of a stretch. So what they're referring to is that the British abolished the slave trade in 1808 and slavery as a whole in 1833. But several European countries actually beat them to that. Specifically, France and Russia. So the first premise of the whole British being 
being honorable in that is, well, kind of defeated by the fact that, well, they were kind of late to the game. And then let's talk about the Atlantic Slave Trade Patrol. So people want to say like, well, look, they were actively trying to stop the slave trade. And yeah, that's kind of true. Putting down a entire squadron is kind of cool. It was highly ineffective. They also did this while they still had legal slavery. And then there's a linkage here that people keep on missing for some reason, which is the fact that America joined that blockade until 1861. That's right, from 1815 to 1861, the United States was actively trying to stop the slave trade across the Atlantic. And that's the problem. You still had white people owning black people. And so to say that white people ended slavery is still quite disgusting. And one last thing, let's talk about some of the myths I've seen cropping up from commenters. So one of the top comments is actually true. It talks about the fact that what would become the United States was not the number one importer of slaves. That was, by and large, Brazil. Unfortunately, this poor guy who commented a true thing as, like, a myth number 11 has been bombarded with a bunch of hate from people as well, so can't even get a victory there. In fact, I've seen a few people who have commented on this and just said something like, I really like this video, thanks for making it, or whatever, and then suddenly a bunch of racist assholes go and attack that person for simply saying that they liked the video. And finally, there are two myths that I've seen crop up a lot, one of which is like the fifth most liked comment on the video, and it's complete and utter bull. This guy is trying to dispute the picture of a former slave with a bunch of scars on his back from being whipped. I've seen a bunch of people try to say that that's not a real photograph and that's not representative and all kinds of different things, and I can't really speak to its being completely reflective because, well, for the most of American slavery, photography wasn't even invented, so it's kind of hard to find photographs for things when photography didn't exist. But the picture that I use is quite famous, and so a bunch of racists have come up with a whole bunch of lies in order to explain it away. Some say that this picture is of a man who was in Africa and was whipped for being a child molester or something like that. And others try to say that this was an exceptional case in some way and have nothing to back it up with. But what that picture is from is a real person, a real slave, who escaped across Civil War battle lines. And this man had a bunch of photographs taken. There's actually a number of them and they're all in the Smithsonian. The guy is often called Whipped Pete. So, all of these are just further malicious myth-making, the kind that we've come to see from all the other commenters. They're willfully distorting the truth in order to fit their own perspective. And finally, the one that I was very much surprised by, there's a whole bunch of anti-Semitism in the comments, and it's completely unwarranted. People are trying to say, well, it was the Jews who were actually controlling the slave trade. No, no, not at all. Other people are trying to say they weren't true Africans being sold into slavery, they were Jews. And, of course, this is all abhorrent. But, yeah, it's there. And I wanted to point out that the people who are all offended by the video have great company among them. So if they're not white supremacists or anti-Semites, they certainly blend in with them pretty well. But ultimately, all of these criticisms of the video come from a place where people want to emphasize their white heritage as if there's nothing wrong there. They don't want to have this whole idea of white guilt, and they're afraid of reparation costs or whatever. All of which are stupid and asinine concerns. There is no reason for you to feel guilt just for being white. That's racist. And there is no reason to pay reparations, nobody's floating that idea. The whole idea of reparations for slavery is more of a justification for things like affirmative action. As in, people of another race were disproportionately affected by this in a very real economic sense that lasts for generations. And so, there needs to be policies that benefit that race in a way to bring them to an equal stature economically. 
Now, if you have a problem with that, that's fine. You, personally, I kind of do too. But denying the reason for the claim of it, because it's a scary claim, is still denying reality. If it is reality, you have to deal with it. So, if you are one of the people who were offended by that video, good. Keep being offended, you'll be the scapegoat of many more videos. And for those who are actually looking for reasonable analysis of history, well, be sure to subscribe, <laughs> because I don't want to sit here and rant. A diatribe is not supposed to be a rant, but this one, I think, was particularly warranted.